Thanks a lot, everyone, for coming today. And thank you for this great um, introduction. And I'm really happy and honored for the invitation to come and speak for your first anniversary. It's really an exciting um, day for our ladies um, to have your first birthday. Um, and yeah, I'm very happy to, um, yeah, happy about the invitation. <laughs> and today I would like to speak about um, my PhD research, which is uh, looking at climate extreme events and global food production or global agriculture. And I'm using random forests, a machine learning algorithm to analyze the complex patterns between climate extremes and agricultural yields. Um, but before I start, I would like to give you just a brief background about me, um, what I did before and how my R journey was uh, so far. Um, I have a degree in environmental engineering from the Technical University in Berlin. And my master thesis actually looked at uh, forests, at boreal forests in Sweden. So here I'm sitting in some kind of random forest somewhere <laughs> in Sweden. <laughs> I just had to make this pun. <laughs> um, and yeah, during my master's degree, I, um, that was the first time that I got into touch with R and um, before I worked with MATLAB, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but now I'm, I like R because it's open source and it's, yeah, it's, it's a great language. And now I'm doing a PhD. Um, yeah, as you correctly said, at, at the Australian German Climate and Energy College. It's a very long name. Um, and my research lo looks at, uh, yeah, as I said, climate extreme events and global agricultural yields. And in general, I'm interested in climate change impacts uh, on agriculture and ecosystems, and also in general in statistical and machine learning techniques to look at data and to do um, predictions. Okay, but why do we care about the impact of climate extreme events and climate change on global agriculture? Um, sorry. Just trying to do it like this. Um, so why do we care? So climate change increases the risks of climate extreme events like droughts and floods, for example, or heat waves. And uh, the agricultural sector is particularly, particularly affected by this because um, agricultural production depends on suitable weather conditions during the growing season. And um, production shocks that lead to, for example, harvest failures, uh, the impacts are not only felt locally where it happens, but also worldwide. Um, so for example, price spikes can lead to, yeah, to reduced, or price spikes lead to that people cannot afford food, for example. So in 2007, the European heat wave, and in 2010, a Russian heat wave led to price spikes that were felt internationally. Here, for example, we can see the timeline of the food price index by the United Nations. And you can see that here is a price spike and there is a price spike, so the prices for uh, food products went up. And if we overlay this time series with the time series of wheat yield anomalies or wheat yields, we can see that here and also here, just before the price spikes, they were below average crop yields. So these harvest failures, they result in um, food insecurity and uh, have international consequences. So it's important to get a better understanding of how climate and agriculture are interrelated to prepare the global food system and yeah, for, for future climate change and for an increase in extreme events. In my talk today, I would like to first talk about, so I'm using random forests to look at these impacts. And in this presentation, I first would like to give an overview of random forest in general, the concept, how they work, um, what the advantages and disadvantages are, and um, how also to set up random forests in R. And then in the second part, I will go into more detail about 
how I used random forest in my own research and um, which kind of findings I found. Okay, so random forest. Who of you has used random forest so far? A few. So half or maybe a bit less than half. So what is a random forest? A random forest is a machine learning um, algorithm based on, on an ensemble of decision trees. It's used for predictive modeling and it can be used for um, classification and um, regression problems. So classification means if, for example, I want to predict the category of a new observation. So for example, in medicine, you might want to predict whether a patient falls into a high risk or low risk um, category of certain um, illnesses. So for example, diabetes. A regression problem means I want to predict an actual absolute value. Um, random forests are a supervised machine learning, or a supervised learning method, which means um, the algorithm takes a training data set um, with predicted and predictor variables and learns the underlying patterns in the data or the relationships in the data. And based on this, it allows to predict new, the category or the value for a new um, observation. And it's first described in Bremen uh, 2001 in the paper. So it's a fairly new method, at least compared to other methods that are often used. Um, and so a, a random forest is based on an ensemble of decision trees. Um, so what is a decision tree? A decision tree basically takes um, an observation sample and tries to find optimal um, decision rules to split the data to um, create groups so that, so, that, um, so that it can make predictions. So as an example, for example, if I, if I watch Netflix and Netflix tries to recommend movies that I might like based on my history, what I'm watching, um, it has passed information on which movies I clicked on, for example, or which movies I looked or watched until the end, and also characteristics of each movie. So for example, which actor uh, was in the movie or which genre the movie is. And based on these kind of information, it tries to predict whether I will like a certain movie or not. So one example decision tree could, for example, be, is it an action movie? Yes then I will probably not like it because I don't like action movies. <laughs> or no, then it asks maybe something else. So is it some <laughs> obscure Scandinavian crime movie? Then maybe I like it if, it's, if it is one. <laughs> if it's not, then maybe not. So this is one decision. It's a very simple decision tree, but um, maybe I only watched one kind of weird Scandinavian movie, and now this decision tree would predict for every Scandinavian movie that I like it. So it is a very simple approach, or it's a, it's, it trains very fast on data, but it also is prone to overfitting or memorizing the data and, um, and may not be accurate for future um, predictions. So one way to overcome this is to have several uh, decision trees based on random subsamples of the data. So for example, the second decision tree could look at, is it a drama? If yes, then I like it. If not, did it win some kind of film prize? And if it did, then maybe, yes, I like it. Or if Netflix knows me a little bit too well, then maybe it will <laughs> just look at whether it has Ryan Gosling in it or not. <laughs> um, so based on three decision trees, it um, actually may have already better predictions because it doesn't always give me the same result based on Scandinavian movies, um, but rather it, there's, a, there's, in this case, for example, three decision trees and they all provide an answer. And if all the answers point towards the same direction, then the accuracy is um, possibly better. And this is the concept of a random forest. So just what I said before, the, the, 
The disadvantages of decision trees are that they tend to overfit data, especially when they are very deep. So if they have a lot of um, decision splits. Um, and there's a trade-off between bias and variance. A small tree has high bias and low variance. So bias means how far away it is from the actual, the correct value. Um, and variance means how robust it is to the, the sample or the, yeah, the sample that I'm using. So high bias means that it's possibly very, that the errors are quite big and um, variance, low variance means that it's less um, sensitive to which data I'm using. A more complex tree, on the other hand, has low bias, so it's more accurate um, for the data that uh, that I, yeah that is more accurate, but it has higher variance. Um, but on new observations, it can have very poor performance due to these um, properties, and this can be overcome by growing a larger number of de independent decision trees based on the random subsample of. Uh, the data set, and that is a random forest. Or oh, that's the underlying principle of a random forest. So for example, if I have a data set like this, so this is the Titanic data set, which probably a few of you know. That's the, from the Kaggle website. It has information on whether a passengers on the Titanic survived or not. So there's, this is just a binary variable and then lots of predictor variables. But this is just as an example to explain or to show how random forests work. So I have a data set with k predictor variables. So all these, all these uh, independent variables. I have one column with a predicted variable. And I have n observations. So in this case, for example, I have 16 rows, so 16 observations. And the way how the random forest algorithm works, it's it creates a large number of decision trees. And for each decision tree, it first randomly selects a subsample of the observation. So it doesn't use the whole data set, but rather a random subsample. So it just chooses several rows in the original full data set. And then based on this subsample, of course it should be larger than four, it's, it's, but it's just to show it. Um, based on the subsample, it creates a decision tree. So for each, at each decision split, it tries to find an optimal split. And at every decision split, it's not seeing the whole predictor variables, but rather a random subsample as well. So instead of using all of these independent variables, it maybe only it only sees three or four variables, for example, and then chooses the best to split the data. Because otherwise, if it would always have the same uh, predictor variables, all of the decision trees would look quite similar. If there's, for example, one variable that um, is very dominant and has a big influence on the outcome, then all the decision trees would always choose this predictor as, as the most optimal one. And therefore, this is the reason why it's um, why well, it's randomly subsampled as well. And then this uh, split is, or this step three is repeated until a specified tree death is reached or until there are no observations anymore, for example. And this is the random forest. It's based on a certain number of decision trees, so 500, 1,000, how many um, you want to use. And the prediction, are then done either for categorical variables um, using a majority vote or for uh, continuous variables using, for example, the mean or some weighted mean or uh, a median, for example. So for a, this is a, an example for a decision a random forest for a categorical variable for colors, for example. And each decision tree basically gives an answer. So for example, red, red blue if I want to predict a color. And then the output of this forest would be red. So that would be the prediction in this case, for example. For a continuous variable, if I have a new observation and I let it run through each of the decision trees, each decision tree then tells me a specific number, for example, 28.1. 1. 
37.5 or 11.7, for example, just as an example. And then the prediction for this observation <coughs> would be, for example, the mean of all these values. So what are the advantages of a random forest? It has relatively good predictive skill, and it can be used for continuous variables, for binary variables, for categorical variables, so it's very flexible. Um, there's almost no preparation of data needed or of the predictor data, so it can be used on different data types. Um, there are no requirements in terms of linearity of the functional relationship, for example, or normality requirements. It can be used also um, to fill missing data, so it can also be used on um, data with gaps. And it's uh, robust to collinearities in the data. And it automatically selects the most important features. So, for example, if I have a big data set and there are lots of variables that are not actually needed, then it will just ignore it. So it's uh, robust to, to additional variables that, are not, that, are not, that, don't, that don't have such an influence on the output. The drawbacks are that it's, or that's the main criticism of random forests, is that it's seen as some kind of black box. Um, so you can't really, you don't have a function or like an equation that you can write down and that's the physical um, relationship between the input and the output variable. So it's harder to interpret than, for example, the output of a linear statistical model. Um, however, there are some diagnostic plots that you can use to look at what's happening inside of the random forest and that help to visualize the pattern between the input variable and the output variable. So it's not completely a black box, but it's just harder to write it down in a mathematical way, or impossible, basically. Um, and yeah, for very large data sets, it can become large in size and slow to train, at least compared to more simple uh, approaches like a linear regression, for example, or something like this. Um, some examples for applications. Um, for example, it's used for land use classification of satellite data. So for example, if you want to identify urban areas from forests, from uh, surface waters, for example, um, random forests can be used for that or have been used. <coughs> it's used for prediction of biological properties of uh, molecules. And it can, for example, also be used for in the finance industry for assessments of credit risks. But these are just some <coughs> examples. Um, it's very easy to set up a random forest in R. You only need a few lines of code, basically. Um, so the random forest needs the random forest library, so you install the library. And in this case, for example, I just um, use or show a data set which has um, house values or house price values in suburbs in Boston. And this is the median value, and these are just some properties or characteristics of the houses. And in order to predict the median price or the median house price based on these predictor variables, um, you would first um, set a subsample, a training sample. So you never use the whole data set, but rather you subset the data into a training and a test um, data set. And then you apply the random forest function in the same way. It's the same structure as the linear model, for example. So the predictor variable and then tilde and all the input or the, um, the independent variables. And to then, so the output of the forest then shows you some very simple uh, information. So for example, um, the R squared or the variance, the explained variance. Um, these kind of skill metrics, the R squared, so the um, residual or the uh, mean squared error, and also the, um, the explained variance are based on out of bag um, observations. So what the random forest algorithm is doing is it leaves out one variable. It's, it's similar to leave one out cross-validation. So it takes out one observation 
um, calculates the random forest and then predicts the value for this one observation. And based on these out of bag um, predictions, the mean squared error and the R squared values are um, calculated. And in some cases, for example, in my case, I, I will speak about it later, um, these kind of um, default error values are just way too good. So in the first moment, you think, oh, yeah, it's a very good prediction, but um, yeah, it doesn't, it's not always advised to use um, the default error values. And then there are two main uh, methods of visualizing the um, random forest model. So the first one is the variable importance plot, which um, shows the average reduction in performance of the model if you randomly perturb one of the variables. So if you randomly perturb the variable and the skill doesn't actually decrease at all, then you know it doesn't actually have a big influence on the output. So this is what the variable importance plot shows. And one way or one way it's calculated is the increase in error or the mean decrease in the Gini coefficient, which is the how equal or how similar observations are in different splits. And the plot shows, so this is for example for the Gini coefficient, and the plot shows all of the predictor variables and then the variable importance um, values, and it's ranked by importance. So in this case, for example, Rm, which is the highest variable, has the highest um, variable importance. And Rm, in this case, is the number of bedrooms. So the number of bedrooms is important for predicting house prices, which um, is probably quite obvious. Um, yeah, so the greater the importance, the more important the predictor variable for the output of for the prediction. So this is the, the first plot. And then the second plot is the partial dependence plot. The partial dependence plot um, lets you look at the functional relationship between the each independent variable and the dependent variable. It shows the marginal effect um, of each predictor variable on the output. So whether it has a positive or negative effect. I'm thinking of it as some kind of sensitivity analysis um, if you keep all of the other predictors constant. So for example, you have a constellation of all values and then you just change this one variable and whether it increases or decreases the output, this is the um, partial dependence. So in this case, for example, if Rm, so the number of bedrooms goes up, then also the house price goes up. So that's a very um, trivial um, functional relationship, but you could also see other kind of um, patterns in the data. OK, so this was a general overview of random forest and how random forests work. <coughs> and now I would like to give you a little bit of an overview of how I'm using it for my research. Um, and so just in general, at first, um, what are the main challenges? So I'm working at the global scale. And I look at climate extreme events and agricultural yields. And extreme events in general are, by definition, rare events. So you need long time series, um, not only for the meteorological data, but also for the agricultural data. And you need it at the appropriate spatial scale. So there are a lot of data sets that are national data. But if you look at, for example, precipitation extremes, then for China or Russia, national data, national yield data doesn't really help you. Um, so data availability is probably for many the main challenge um, to actually get the data that you can work with. And then in my case, collinearity between predictor variables is a problem. For example, um, if there is a drought and well, drought and temperature are very much um, they co-vary. If, for example, temperature goes up um, and there is a heat extreme, then it also leads to increased evaporation, for example, and the soil is drying, and so there's also a higher likelihood of a drought. Um, 
and there are complex interactions between the variables, the climate variables, and the yield variable. <coughs> For example, if there's one extreme event and another extreme event happens at the same time or in the same growing season, then the plant is possibly already more vulnerable to this second extreme. So, um, so it's not clearly separated. And there are nonlinear effects. So, for example, there can be threshold effects. If the temperature goes above a, a certain value, then it has a, a very negative, a nonlinear negative effect on crop yields. Oh, sorry. So, um, our research approach was so we have a global gridded crop yield data set um, provided by a researcher in the US who actually contacted all the agricultural statistics or all the statistics agencies in lots of countries and asked them for our subnational yield data. And I'm very grateful that I can use this data set because that's a huge effort to um, develop such a database. Um, and we combine it with gridded data on extreme event indicators. So there are um, global data sets on extreme indicators already calculated or already developed. And I'm using climate observations as well. And due to these challenges and what I said about the advantages of random forests, um, we are applying a random forest algorithm to these data sets because they are robust to collinearities and um, they don't, the random forest algorithm doesn't make any assumptions about, for example, the pattern or the functional relationship in the data. Yeah, so this should not be here, but anyway. Um, so we have the historical climate data and a crop calendar. So a crop calendar for every grid cell or for every region in the world, it, and for also for every crop type, it tells you, or it contains the information, when, is the, when does the growing season start and when does it stop? Um, and based on these two data sets, um, I calculated the growing season climate. So for example, the temperature, the mean temperature or mean precipitation over January to June, for example, for a certain grid cell and a certain crop type. And um, we regridded all the data to the same grid and detrended the time series because both the climate um, time series as well as the yield time series have trends. And we were not interested in correlating trends, but rather to look at above or below average or below expectation yields. So we detrended the time series for every grid cell and standardized them uh, relative to their standard deviation. And we also applied a, yeah, and then we, on these anom anomalies, we applied the random forest um, predictor or algorithm to predict um, crop yield anomalies for every grid cell in the world, basically. Um, so whether it's above or below average based on anomalies of precipitation, temperature, and so on. And we did a cross-validation, so we always left out 20% of the years and trained the random forest on 80% of the years. And we did that five times, and then combined all of the out-of-sample predictions together um, into a new time series or into a <coughs> continuous time series. So we have information on mean climate during the growing season, especially mean temperature and mean precipitation and the te temperature range. And then we have information or data on extreme indicators. So um, heat extremes, for example, um, frost extremes, um, the frequency of unusually warm days, so days that are above the 90th percentile of temperature, or unusually cold nights, for example. So these are our extreme indicators. And they're all gridded data, global gridded data. So just to visualize or to, to give you some feeling of how the data looks like. And so for every grid cell, we have all these time series over 47 years. And we correlate or we try to predict the anomalies for every grid cell. 
And all these climate data sets are in NetCDF format. Who has worked with NetCDF before? I know that you have been. <laughs> Anyone else? No. Because before I started my PhD, I never worked with NetCDF files either. Um, now I work with it all the time, so it becomes normal to me. But um, they are basically a format to store these kind of gridded data sets. And they are, um, they are the standard file format for atmospheric science, climate science, or oceanography. Um, so for example, climate model output is stored as NetCDF files or meteorological observations. And they always have um, the metadata inside the file, so variable names, units, and so on, the time information. And they are all um, in this gridded format where you can, for example, choose just one grid cell in the world, and it doesn't actually read in all of the other um, data. So it has a lot of advantages, but it can also be a steep learning curve. And for me, it was always a blessing and a curse. And it's a, I see the, it has a lot of advantages, these kind of standardized data formats, but you can also become insane <laughs> when you work with NetCDF files. So, um, and R has a library to work with NetCDF files. So R, <coughs> NetCDF, and, and NetCDF 4, and also other libraries. So if ever you work with climate data and you come across um, NetCDF files, don't despair. <laughs> There's a way to access the data, but it might take a while. I was recently reading an article about um, uh, a data scientist at the New York Times who wanted to visualize the hurricane, the recent hurricane tracks. And he described that he spent one day of trying to get data out of a NetCDF file. Mm -hmm. And after a while, he gave up. And he asked some climate scientists to convert it into a CSV file. And then he worked with a CSV file. <laughs> but I, I could recognize myself in this <laughs> example. So I thought it was quite funny. <clears throat> So in terms of the results, how much of the global and uh, continental yield variability can be explained by the random forest? Um, so these are, these are the different crops, so maize, soya beans, spring wheat, and rice. And then actually I forgot to add the, the regions. I should have done this. Um, so. The first one, the gray one, is the global value. And then the others are the continental values. But for some reason, I removed the legend. Um, but for now, the continental, uh, the global values are the most interesting. So our statistical model is able to explain about 50% of the variance in yield anomalies <coughs> um, of maize and spring wheat yields. <coughs> so it's quite a considerable amount um, because yields in general are not 100% affected by climate, but also by management um, changes, for example, or other factors. So um, you would never expect uh, values of 80%, for example. So 50% or nearly 50% is um, yeah, a relatively good value. And for soya beans and rice, it's around one fifth or one uh, quarter of uh, of the anomalies that is explained by the random forest model, and for Australia, so this is um, this is Australia. So, well, this is Australia. Um, this in Australia, Australia has the highest um, R squared value of all of the regions, and um, wheat fluctuations are explained up to around seventy percent. Um, by climate uh, factors. Because uh, the, the reason is that the weather or the climate in Australia is very variable, especially rainfall. And wheat basically goes up and down with, with, with uh, precipitation. And then we were interested in how much of the variability or how much of the yields are actually affected not by just mean conditions, but extreme events, so extreme indicators. And we 
calculated two models, one with all of the predictor variables and one a reduced model which only contains mean conditions, so mean precipitation or mean temperature. And we calculated the difference between the two and um, took the difference as an indicator of the contribution of extreme events. Um, and we found, so this is the, these are always the full values, so the whole statistical model, and then the darker shade, and also the values in brackets um, are the R-squared values for the reduced model. And then this is just the difference between these two values. So this is the contribution of extreme indicators, or the estimated co contribution of um, extreme indicators to uh, the yield variability. And we found that for maize, um, extreme indicators contribute 43%, for rice, uh, 25%, and then for soya and spring wheat, 20 and 18%. So um, quite, a, quite a considerable amount to increase the R squared values. OK, so the, we were then interested in the which variables have the highest variable importance. So is it more precipitation extreme events, or is it more temperature extremes, or is it maybe not even extreme events, but rather just mean um, climate data or cl mean climate conditions during the growing season? And we found, so these are the variable importance plots for each of the crop types, <laughs> and we plotted the increase in mean squared error. So um, if a specific variable is taken out, then the mean squared error would increase by this percentage. Um, and we found that for all of the crops, temperature-related predictor variables are the most important ones. So the red ones are temperature-related, and the blue ones are precipitation related. And for, for example, May, soya beans, and spring wheat, it's all the warm day frequency. So that means how many days during the growing season are unusually hot, um, so above the 90th percentile. And mean temperature, for example, is also very high among all of the crops, which has important implications, for example, for climate change because um, temperature changes are more certain than precipitation changes. And um, an increase in temperature is related to an increase in heat waves. And so the importance of this predictor specifically means, it doesn't mean, or it's not a good sign, let's say, at least if we show that it has a negative influence, um, which we see soon as well. Um, yes, OK. So temperature-related um, predictors have the biggest influence. Um, and then we created the partial dependence plots to actually see whether, yeah, how the relationship looks like, whether temperature has a negative effect with increasing temperature, for example, or if, if there is some other kind of functional relationship. Um, and so these are the variable importance plots. These are the variable, and not the variable important, the partial dependence plots, which means the marginal effect of, uh, of a specific value of the variable of interest. So the first row shows the marginal effect of warm day frequency, so unusually hot days. Um, the second row shows the effect of cold night frequency, so um, all days or nights where the minimum temperature is below the 10th percentile and the 10th percentile of minimum temperatures. And here we see the marginal effect of uh, precipitation, of mean precipitation for each crop type. And so for example, for, for the, the um, uppest or the highest row, um, all of the functional relationships are basically negative, a negative correlation. So the higher the temperature, the lower the yield or the anomaly of yield. So it has a clearly negative um, effect if um, extreme warm days increase in temperature or in frequency. Um, 
there's also a so this related to climate change um, minimum temperatures are at least in some cases or uh, in general uh, in predicted to increase so there's an inc increase in maximum and in minimum temperatures on average and um, so this increase in temperatures so the decrease in cold nights would have a positive effect which could to a certain degree possibly offset some of the yield losses. So here we also see an increase in cold nights has a negative effect or a decrease in cold nights has a um, positive effect. Um, and for precipitation, the association or the relationship is less clear. So there's no, it's not as clear as for the temperature effect. Oh, that's, I think that's an old, anyway. Um, so yeah, so these were the results. So um, temperature effects were the most important ones and temperature has a, an increase in extreme temperature has a negative effect. Um, just to give some kind of summary of what I learned using random forests um, in my research is, um, well, yeah, is to be aware of autocorrelation in the data or to be aware of data leakage. So the first time I created a random forest and I used the out of bag um, mean squared error skill metrics or the um, R squared value uh, based on the default value that is in the random forest package. Um, I had really high R squared values. I was very happy. I had values of 95% or something like this. Um, but I also was very suspicious and I felt like this can't be true. Um, and for example, in my case, I have uh, data sets that have different spatial resolutions. So the extreme indicators are at a coarser resolution than the other data sets and downscaling them. So increasing the resolution means you, you basically duplicate information. And uh, the same for the yield data. And if you then apply the random forest without some kind of spatial subsampling or any way of taking this, these underlying resolutions <laughs> into account, you have data leakage or information leakage from, for example, one grid cell to the next. So the random forest just uses a neighboring grid cell to predict the grid cell next to it or the yield next to it because the temperature, for example, and the yield will be quite similar. Um, yeah, so these are, or also, so this is true for spatial autocorrelation, but of course also for temporal correlation, or for temporal autocorrelation. Um, yeah, that's also related to that. So the skill metrics, um, they are a good first guess, and if you have absolutely independent data points, which of course is the ideal case, um, then probably the out of bag error skill metrics or the error metrics and the skill metrics are um, a good first guess, but in general I would advise to um, calculate your own skill metrics based on your data and based on your case. And I included partial dependence plots to the, to the plots because otherwise it's very easy to overinterpret and overinterpret um, the plots. You see some kind of pattern and you want to see some pattern and it maybe fits into your story, but when you actually add the partial dependence plots, then you often see that the uncertainty is so large that actually you can't really say anything. It's not a positive or negative um, effect. Okay, so just in summary, Random forests are machine learning techniques used for classification and um, prediction um, regression. It has high accuracy and efficiency on large data sets. And the advantage is that only little data preparation is needed compared to other um, types of analysis. And also it can be used with data that has gaps in the data set. It's a black box kind of um, method, but there are visualization tools that help you to actually look into the, into the model and into the data. And that's it. Thank you, and happy birthday again. <laughs>